Again, we're dealing with fallacies, and we are in chapter 7 now, and last session we dealt with uh, two fallacies that, or maybe two and a half if you count smoke screen as a different fallacy, that didn't fit into those families of fallacies that we had. You remember we had fallacies that deal with parts in the whole, and fallacies that deal with emotion, we had fallacies that dealt with um, authority or experts. Um, what else did we have? What, you talked the whole half of the class? Yeah, the last several weeks. Um, well, the bad argument fallacy? Well, all fallacies are bad arguments. We had another family of fallacies. Oh, yeah, well, the one, two rounds don't make a right. Yeah, that was sort of independent. And actually, that's going to be a little bit closer to what we're looking at today. Again. Yeah. yeah, that's all emotions. Okay. And, uh, popularity. Yes, exactly. Arguments that have to do with, you know, with popularity. Now, today we're looking at arguments that um, they place under this rubric of ad hominem. Or... <coughs> acts on um, <coughs> person. That's a family of fallacies. There is, there's more than one that your book outlines and, and there's um, even if your book was a different textbook and, and didn't distinguish them, we would still want to do some work of, of disentangling them. There are certain fallacies that get mixed up with each other. That's why I put all these, these families of fallacies up because these are the ones that students most typically confuse with each other. Um, and why do they do that? Well, because they're similar, right? Parts of the whole, composition and division. On the last test, some students got those mixed up. They completely reversed them. So they knew that they were dealing with composition and division, right? They just mixed up which ones they were. When you guys get to the arguments uh, dealing with popularity, um, you might find yourself mixing up appeal to popularity and appeal to tradition. And so that's why we talked about how to distinguish them, right? So ad hominem arguments, we want to look at um, all the different types that are, that are available and how to tell them apart from each other. So your book starts out uh, saying the ad hominem argument is the most common of all mistakes in reasoning. Um, that might be true. It is very, very common. Um, where do you see these sorts of things? Turn on any political talk show, and you'll see somebody doing it. Uh, given an, any average half an hour, somebody will do it. Um, where else do we do these kind of things? Uh, ad hominem means against the person. So instead of actually addressing the claim, you say something about the person. Where else have you guys seen this? Yeah, I said politics. Yeah. Where else? But yeah, you're right. Politics is probably the most egregious area for this. High school. What's that? High school. High school, yeah. People uh, criticizing each other for very trivial things. Um, maybe teachers criticizing students for that. Teacher, or students criticizing teachers. Um, About what comedians. Else? What's that? About comedians. Oh. And that's what I haven't actually thought of. Um, you know, people do the rows like the ladies. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. And, and if you think about what's going on in comedy is a little bit different than making arguments because um, oftentimes what you're putting out there in comedy is understood as I'm not, I don't really believe this. I'm just putting it out there to get a laugh, right? Those roasts, yeah, those are those can get kind of vicious, can't they? And, and you can tell some of those people really don't like each other, do you think? So they might actually be making arguments. This person is a total jerk, don't listen to anything that they, they say. Um, the one for Chevy, for Chevy Chase, I watched that. Why was he a, a bad sport? Um, he's a sour guy. Um, yeah, you could say there's a lot of ad hominem attacks. If you took comedy, and you turn that into political arguments or religious arguments or arguments for anything, a lot of those would just be ad hominem attacks. This person is a jerk, this person has these characteristics, so yeah. What about your personal life? That's what I thought you guys would come up with right away. You've never 
heard anybody respond to one of your claims by attacking you? You've never done that to anybody else? Every day. <laughs> yeah. Anyone who's got kids, uh, kids do this all the time. So, um, it is a very common fallacy. And um, let's look at the different types that they, they have. They talk about the personal attack ad hominem. And it gives examples. Um, Johnson has such and such a negative feature, therefore his claim, belief, opinion, theory, proposal stands refuted. And we call it, you know, a personal attack because you're actually saying something about the person. And if you think about the structure of the ad hominem, what you have is the person, and the person is making a claim, and instead of engaging the claim directly, instead of attacking the claim, which, you know, might be weak, right? You attack the person, and if you can discredit the person, then what happens to the claim? That's the way our minds work, right? Um, is that really is that really true? Um, well, can you have a claim that's made by somebody who doesn't have a very good reputation? Yeah. And it could be true. Sure. Um, I mean, we do tend to associate reliability with certain characteristics and, and unreliability or, or lack of credibility with certain characteristics. But most characteristics are not actually that relevant to whether a claim is true that's being made by somebody. So uh, this actually goes to some of the things we talked about before, the past interested parties. You remember all that discussion? Just because a party is interested doesn't mean you can automatically dismiss their claim. So let's say students are arguing for a lower tuition. Does that mean we can automatically dismiss your claim? No, there might be good reasons for lowering tuition. Let's say professors are in favor of higher professor salaries. Again, can you dismiss the claim outright? No, you, you want to actually see whether there's any basis for it. If they say something like, I would like higher salaries for professors because I'm a professor and I need a higher salary. <coughs> okay, that's pretty weak, isn't it? Right? Or I'm, I'm a student, I would like lower tuition because I just don't like paying so much. Uh, again, not a very good argument. But you evaluate that based on the claim itself and on the arguments that are supporting it. Okay, so back to personal attack ad hominem. Um, like it says, there's, there's many negative features we can attribute to a person. Some of these are intellectual. And it talks about people being ignorant or stupid. And, you know, I've pointed this out in the past. There is a difference between being ignorant, that is not knowing certain things, and being sort of stupid or obstinate or just not having much of the ball. But, is the fact that somebody is ignorant, does that discredit the truth? Does that, does that um, nullify the truth of their claim? Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, you should be very skeptical of people who are making claims about things that they don't know much about, right? But you would still want to see, is the claim actually true? You wouldn't want to say, well, they're not a doctor, so therefore their diagnosis that they're pretending to give of me is automatically false. Let's say somebody comes up to you and says, oh, I can, um, I can tell you've got cancer. I'm just looking at you, and, and you look kind of cancerous. Well, that's silly, right? But that doesn't mean you don't have cancer. You can't automatically go to the other uh, side and, and you can say that. Um, what else? Um, Self-interest. He talks about people being self-serving or feathering their own nest. You guys know what that means? That, that, what does that uh, phrase mean? Feathering your own nest. Bless you. Thank you. Worrying about yourself and only yourself. It's not so much worry. It's, it has to do more with the kind of action. Looking out for it. Yeah. Caring for yourself. You're, getting, you're, you're on the right track. Boosting your own confidence kind of thing. Mm, not exactly. Um, they were actually closer to it. They're they're on the way. Um, think about the term nest egg. What's your nest egg? You build money. What's that? You build it. It's money that you put aside, right? Feathering your own nest actually means um, getting things for yourself. So you know, uh, saving things away. Sometimes we actually talk about squirreling things away, right? Because what do squirrels do? They hide all sorts of nuts. Um, Squirrels actually aren't very good investors, though, are they? Because they, they forget where they put most of the things. 
<laughs> okay, so maybe somebody is self-serving or feathering their own nest. Maybe they have a proposal for you, and they're going to make more money on it than you are. Does that mean that you automatically discredit their claim? No, you should, you should of course, be skeptical of their claim. <coughs> that doesn't mean that their claim is automatically null and void. Um, maybe they're accused of being, and here we see some of the terms we talked about when we were looking at emotion and at um, language, being a racist or a sexist or a fascist. Um, if you charge people with these sorts of things, that's, that's really a personal attack, and a lot of times this is done precisely just not to have to engage with somebody's claim. You know, if you don't want to, if, if, if you're the right um, sex, or I suppose even if you're, if you're a male, it's very rare that males charge females with being sexist, but, but it happens. There are males who charge other males with being sexist so that they can dismiss them, you know. Um, but, you know, if a, if a woman wants to attack what a man is saying, and she has an audience that is not very critical in their thoughts, she can call him a sexist and then dismiss his claim, right? Yeah. Um, same thing happens with political things. That person's a rabid right-winger. That person's a crazy liberal. Um, again, that's not actually looking at the person's claim. That's just looking at their, their political uh, commitments. Um, being a cheat, being cruel, being uncaring, prone to kick dogs, <laughs> um, drown kittens, you know, any, any terrible things. These are all personal attacks. These are all ways of dismissing a person and thereby dismissing their claim. Um, now, there, there are some qualities that I think would actually be relevant to, to a person's claim. Being a cheat is, is actually getting close to it. Let's say, here, here would be the most um, clear-cut case. Let's say somebody is a chronic liar. You would have good reason to doubt their claim then, or to dismiss their claim, wouldn't you? I mean, it could be that, that their claim is still true. You all remember the famous story of the boy who cried wolf? You know, he, he liked to get attention, so he would cry wolf when there weren't any wolves, and then what happens to him? Uh, he gets, uh, he becomes the victim of his own devices. Uh, he cries wolf when the wolf is after him, and nobody believes him. Well, in that case, his claim was actually true, wasn't it? But they had good reason not to believe him. See, here's the thing. <clears throat> Do you actually have good reason to dismiss somebody's claim? I think if somebody was a chronic liar, yeah, that, that would be a personal characteristic that would allow you to do that. But whether they're mean, well, mean people often say a lot of true things, don't they? Sometimes they're mean precisely because of the way they say true things. Um, how do I look today? You look awful. <laughs> right? That's not very nice, but it may be true. Yeah. Right? Um, they often say the truth hurts. What's that? They often say the truth hurts. The truth hurts. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I think most, most people can only take uh, truth in, in uh, limited doses about certain things, right? Um, now, like it says, the point to remember is that shortcomings in a person, so on this end, the, the, the source or the origin, are not equivalent to shortcomings in the person's ideas, proposals, theories, opinions, claims, or arguments. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be skeptical, but that means that you can't automatically go from dismissing the origin to dismissing the, uh, the claim that's made. Um, Okay, so that's the personal attack at hominem. That one's the most straightforward. Now we're going to look at the inconsistency attack at hominem. And this one, uh, sometimes people mix up with two wrongs make a right. And the thing to remember with that, two wrongs make a right has to do primarily with justifying behavior or proposals. Inconsistency goes beyond that. Um, with inconsistency, what you're saying is that the person's claim is inconsistent with something about that, that person. So they couldn't really be making that claim. So therefore, the claim must be false. So for example, um, here's, yeah, here, here's one that Rush Limbaugh said about George Bush. Notice both, both of them on the same political side. 
The president says now he believes in global warming, but ladies and gentlemen, when the president was campaigning, he scoffed at that idea. So what is he saying there? The president at that time, George Bush, couldn't really believe in the idea now because he didn't believe in it before. He would be inconsistent. Um, something like that is going on with Barack Obama right now, isn't it? He campaigned as, among other things, the anti-war candidate. Has he, has he actually ended the Iraq war? No, no actually, he, he set a timetable, 18 months. And a lot of people are pointing out, now we're looking at getting into, possibly, on the ground, a third war in another Arab country. Actually, Afghanistan's not an Arab country, but people keep calling it that, right? Um, <coughs> um, <coughs> so, is he being inconsistent? Well, I mean, think about this. Can a person change their mind on, on a situation when they get more information? Yeah. Um, so that doesn't necessarily invalidate their claim. Um, you can also find, your book gives you the example of uh, religious leaders, right? Religious organizations will generally have some sort of official doctrine that those who are involved in it, in that organization, are supposed to believe. Um, do all of them actually believe everything that their organizations teach? No. So if a, um, let me think of a good example. The, the Catholic Church teaches that abortion is a uh, very serious moral evil. Does that mean that no priest could come out and be for abortion? Or that the priest would thereby be inconsistent? He would be out of, out of line with his, his organization, right? Um, but as an individual, he might actually be for abortion. Um, some churches are actually fairly strongly for abortion, like United Church of Christ. Uh, um, they always frame it not in terms of abortion, but in terms of women's reproductive rights or you know, things like that. But it really has to do with abortion. Does that mean that every minister in the United Church of Christ is, in fact, for abortion? There could be some that are actually you know, very strongly against abortion. Just because they belong to an organization that they don't completely agree with does not invalidate their, their claims. Um, Democrats, uh, as a party, they actually have a plank, they're, they're pro-abortion. Does that mean that nobody could be a Democrat and be against abortion? There's actually a group called Democrats for Life. They're totally marginalized. Um, they were founded by, uh, I think his name was Bill Casey. Uh, he was a governor of Pennsylvania, um, got sidelined in the 1996 uh, um, Democratic Convention. Um, what about Republicans? Are Republicans usually for or against gay rights? Does that mean that every Republican is, is against gay rights? There's actually a group called the Log Cabin Republicans who are, what makes them what they are, they're pro-gay rights. I'm not sure what the association with log cabin and, and gay rights is, but I'm sure there must be some, right? So are they inconsistent? Uh, no. Now, your, your uh, book also points out, what about behavior? So you have beliefs, you know, do all your beliefs uh, gel together? Are you perfectly consistent in your beliefs? I doubt any of you are. As a matter of fact, I'm not, in, I'm not completely consistent in my beliefs. I have people pointing out to me every once in a while, Hey, those two things that you're saying don't actually match up. You can't believe in both of those at the same time. And I'll say, well, I need to think about that. You know, and sometimes I <clears throat> revise my beliefs or, or get rid of some. What about behavior? This is where the two wrongs make a right comes up. Right? Think of the example that I had before of the parent who says, you shouldn't smoke. And then the child retorts, but you smoke. But you smoke. Or... You did smoke, or um, I can't think of anything else that would come up with that. <clears throat> they might say something similar. Well, but you drink. What's the difference between drinking and smoking? Or that one comes up with drugs too, doesn't it? Um, parents will find their kids smoking marijuana, and then they say, you know, you shouldn't be smoking pot. And then they'll say, yeah, but you drink, and, and alcohol is a drug, so you take drugs too, or, or you take prescription drugs, right? Um, 
What are they accusing their parent of? They're accusing their parent of inconsistency. So because the person is inconsistent, the claim falls apart, and they like that because then that means they get to do whatever they want without criticism. People do this all the time. Um, now, if uh, being able to lay down moral rules or make moral judgments depended on one actually following them, um, would very many of us be able to make any moral judgments? Or, or teach anything, you know? I mean, could I teach an ethics class? Probably not, if that was the case. I've done a lot of bad things in my life, in a lot of different areas, you know? See, the, the claim doesn't depend for its truth on the, on the person. As a matter of fact, I could be a complete you know, amoral, uh, cutthroat, um, betray you, you know, for, for a dollar uh, scumbag, and I could make a true judgment about um, your, you know, your current state or the situation that you're in or what you ought to be doing or what you ought not to be doing. I could make a true claim, and it doesn't depend on my character. You, you would have grounds for being suspicious. Right? Uh, who can you think of that? Who, who you wouldn't uh, particularly trust to make moral judgments? Can you think of any celebrities besides uh, besides um, Charlie Sheen? What's that was Snooki from Jersey Shore? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's say we take Snooki from Jersey Shore on sexual morality. Right? <laughs> now, let's say Snooki uh, um, she gets in trouble, so she has to do some community service time. Right? And part of that community service time is going into high schools and talking to girls at risk for teen pregnancy about um, uh, not having sex. Yeah, either either abstinence or about you know being very careful about your partners, you know that sort of stuff. And she goes in, and, and let's say she's being completely insincere, and she's she's just getting up there, and she's got like a card, and she's reading off of it. Um, it'd be sort of like Charlie Sheen saying, you know, shouldn't do, shouldn't do coke, you know. Um, they don't really believe it, but the truth of that claim doesn't depend on them believing it or living it out, right? Um, it would be somebody who could associate with cheating. Uh, Bernie Madoff. Oh! <laughs> so Bernie Madoff gets up there and does a public service announcement about um, investment schemes and knowing who your financial advisors are. And he says, you know, you should really look carefully at the bottom line where the money's going. Look at the prospectus. Uh, check out the credit rating of, the, of the, the firms. I know because I'm Bernie Madoff and I've cheated people out of billions of dollars, right? Um, actually, he might be in a particularly good position to tell you about that sort of thing. There's, there's an interesting show out there, the premise of which is actually not bad. What is it called? Um, Bre Breakout Kings, I think. Um, I want to see who can break out of uh, <laughs> jail. Well, it's about these, yeah, these people who've, who've I to say the gotten out of uh, prison, and they're all criminals, yeah. right? And they're all kind of sketchy people. Um, of course, they all have a heart of gold, you know, because it's, it's a, you know, it's got to be a show that we like, we can identify with. And all these people are saying, yeah. Uh, put us to track down the criminals, because we have a good idea, we have criminal minds, we know where they're going to go, we'll be able to catch them better. And of course in the show, at least it works out that way. Now is the claim that they're making, you know, or the, the multiple claims that they're making, this person is over here, here's why, they're true or false independently of whether these people are criminals or not, whether the people searching for them are. Um, as a matter of fact, in this case, they, they may be something like experts. Right? Um, what else can be uh, inconsistency? Um, it talks about the Latin tu quoque, which I brought up with respect to uh, two wrongs make a right. Tu quoque means you too. So when you say to somebody, well, you know, you, you can't believe that, that claim because you do it too. Um, you can't be against that because you do it. You're, um, making a, a, an argument against them by inconsistency. <laughs> Circumstantial ad hominem. 
uh, circumstances are things about a person or their situation, right? <clears throat> Somebody's circumstances are such and such, therefore their claim, belief, or opinion stands refuted. So uh, it, it brings up the, the thing about abortions and priests here. But think about all the other circumstances. What else could, could be, what else could one be involved with where you might then dismiss their claim? Um, think about jobs. If professors are testifying about why we should not cut the education budget, you might not believe their claims, right? What if a professor actually gets up and testifies for cutting the education budget? You also might not believe their claim. Why? Well, they're a professor. How can they possibly be cutting their own throat that way? Right? Or um, think about uh, British Petroleum, right? BP. Could they really be for alternative energy sources? They're an oil company. Well, what's the other name of, of BP? Beyond Petroleum. They have invested a lot of money into research and, and development for alternative energy sources. And you can actually understand why. You know, there's only so much oil. What's going to happen to BP when all the oil is gone? If all they do is oil, yeah, that's it for them, right? Uh, if they invest in alternative energy sources, they they could actually make out. Yeah. Another part you got to look at is plastic uses a lot of petroleum mm. waste. You're right. Yeah. And what do they use to make the alternative energy sources? Oh yeah. What yeah. usually how? Sure, sure. That that's a whole big different different can of worms. Same thing with ethanol. It, it takes a lot of oil to actually make ethanol. There's all sorts of alternative uh, uh, costs to these sort of things that are not taken into account. I'm actually very receptive to those arguments, and I, I've made them in a, in a lot of cases. I'm actually, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something about myself, which might make you uh, question my moral um, judgment. Ethanol is, is really kind of a scam for the reasons that um, Mr. Stone has pointed out. Namely, that what's not taken into account with, with you know, green fuel and stuff like that is that it takes good old-fashioned hydrocarbon fuels like oil to, to produce them. So if you want to grow corn to make ethanol, you have to have a tractor and a combine and, you know, the, the workers that are driving to the fields and their trucks, they're not driving, you know, fuel-efficient cars, they're driving trucks, are using oil and uh, the uh, uh, trains and the um, <clears throat> ships and the, the trucks that take all the grain here and there, that all takes oil too, right? Why am I actually for it then if I know that it's, it's really kind of a scam? Well, because I'm from the Midwest. And where do you think most of the corn is being produced? In the Midwest. And so what the ethanol the whole big ethanol network really amounts to is people from, from richer liberal states who are you know, big on green energy and all this sort of stuff, they're willing to have the federal government pump all sorts of money into the Midwest, which is my region, and if they're dumb enough to do that, if they're dumb enough to transfer money from the richer liberal states where people are all about green stuff to the uh, which are, you know, to the, to the Midwest, which are mostly red states, um, and uh, where people are, you know, more conservative and are growing corn and things like that. There's a sucker born every minute, they say, right? And, and if they want to be suckers, and it's going to benefit my region, I'm for it. <coughs> now, would that invalidate my making claims about ethanol actually being kind of a, you know, in, in the broad scheme? Uh, maybe scam is a little bit too too strong of a word, but it's it's kind of like that. It's, it's a it's a scheme. It's shuffling money from from one group to another. Because I'm I'm actually in favor of it. Does that mean that um, my claims about it become invalidated? No. no. Matter of fact, um, I might be a better person to consult about it because I'm quite honest about you know um, what I think about it. Uh, finally, poisoning the well. Um, do you guys know where this idea comes from? Poisoning the well? Probably 
not because you haven't read a lot of history and you've never experienced um, having you know foreign troops on your soil or anything like that. You poison wells when either you invade somebody and you want to just wipe them out completely. You also salt their fields. That was an old thing that they did in the past. They put salt into the field so that nothing could grow there again. Um, you poison a well when you're retreating and the enemy is coming in and you don't want them to have any drinking water. So poisoning the well destroys things utterly. It's sort of like dropping a nuclear bomb. Right? It's got grave consequences. Poisoning the well in argument means attacking a person with the kind of things that are so devastating to character that it's very difficult for them to, to recover from. So, you know, what are some examples? Um, your book doesn't actually uh, give you too many. <coughs> let's say you, let's say we, we do something fake, actually. Um, somebody's making a claim, you dig up some evidence on them that's not actually real evidence, that they killed somebody and got away with it. Well, that's poisoning the well. Oh, that's a good one too. Yeah, yeah. Saying or or uh, corruption, you know. Yeah. Um, or you know, you, you go Identity back and theft. what's up? Identity theft. Identity theft. Yeah, people don't like that. Dig up racist comments, you know, whether they actually made them or not. Um, I remember when Hillary Clinton. This is a while back before she was running for president. Something came up about a remark she had said 20 years before, uh, and this was about, I would say, eight years ago. And she had, I forget exactly what she'd said, um, it was about somebody who was Jewish. And it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, very good, but it wasn't like, you know, terrible. But it was enough that she felt that she needed to go and apologize for it, even though it had been 20 years before. Um, why did people bring that sort of stuff up? Well, they were poisoning the well. They were getting ready to say that she, she shouldn't actually be credited with anything. Back in the 1980s, the Republicans actually started putting together a database. Um, and the Democrats have done the same thing in a long time. Um, putting together a database of comments that, that Democratic um, candidates or... or um, office holders had said, just in case they could use it as ammunition against them later on. That's an example of poisoning the well, too, um, except sort of doing it surreptitiously and in advance. Um, finally, <clears throat> we have two other fallacies that are pretty similar. So I want to distinguish these. One is uh, called the genetic fallacy, and this doesn't have anything to do with race or genes or anything like that. It means genetic in the sense of dealing with origins, where things come from. Uh, Genesis, the Greek word, means origin. So actually, like, the book of Genesis is the book of origins, the, the book of where things came from. It has the same structure. If you can discredit the source or the origin, then you discredit the claim or the, the thing. And you see a lot of this... Um, with respect to, to groups, um, like it says, he reserves the use of genetic fallacy for cases where it's not a person, but some sort of entity, like a political party, or, or a club, or an industrial group, or even an entire epoch. I'll give you an example of what he means by that. An epoch is a period of time. What do you guys know about the Middle Ages? Probably not an awful lot, right? It's mostly from... from high school or college um, history classes? Humanities. Or humanities, okay. Now, in the Middle Ages, did people think that the world was flat? Uh, I'm sure. Some say no, some say they're not sure, others are nodding their heads. What are they? What's that? What time period? In the Middle Ages. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, if you read the writers of the Middle Ages, they say things like, um, the world is round, as all of us know. Now, that gets passed over in, in the history books, because the way that we teach it is, well, the Middle Ages were this dark ages, 
And you know, there was, there was the ancient period, and there was Greece and Rome, and it rose up, and then the barbarians came in, and it was a long, long dark age, the age of faith, until when? The Renaissance. And that was the rebirth of learning. Well, actually, if you, have, if you study medieval history, you find out that there were a lot of brilliant thinkers, that there were constant rebuildings of things, that these guys were actually pretty on the ball. Um, so St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, in um, his Summa Theologia, which is written for beginners, he uses that phrase, he talks about uh, the world being round. He says, as Aristotle demonstrated, and as we all know, the world is round. Uh, the guy that I do a lot of research on, uh, St. Anselm, he just drops that as an aside in one of his works. He says, yeah, the world is round, and then he goes on to make an argument, which means that these people not only knew it, they knew it as a commonplace that everybody else knew. So why do we think they didn't know about that? Well, because, you know, we've all been taught this thing about up until Christopher Columbus, they thought they'd sail off the edge of the world, and there were some people like that. But that means that we're actually ignorant about what took place back then. Now, if we're dismissing an entire era based on that sort of stuff, Ah, they couldn't have possibly known about anything in the Middle Ages. We're committing the genetic fallacy. Um, and then you could do that with, with really any time period you like. Um, he also uses the example of politics. If you were to say, well, you know, that comes from the Democratic Party, so therefore it's false. That's the genetic fallacy. If you do that and say that's coming from the Republican Party, therefore it's false. Again, the genetic fallacy. A lot of people like to do this with ideas that came from uh, Hitler, or that Hitler, you know, was in agreement with, or, um, or the communists, right? Well, um, this idea, the Nazis practice. <coughs> you know, an idea stands on its own, and you have to evaluate it on its own. You can't just look at the origin of it. You have to think about whether the idea has any, any weight, any merit, any, any validity to it. So that's the genetic fallacy. Now, your book also talks about positive ad hominem fallacies. I'm going to skip over that. We're going to go to straw man. Straw man is similar to these. Straw man is really easy to mix up with these. And why? Because you're making an attack. Um, what in, you call it again? Straw man. It's in, it's in your text. Straw man. Yeah. It's right after uh, positive ad hominem fallacies. What's different about straw man is you're not attacking the person as such. You're attacking their argument. And the reason you're attacking their argument is to make another argument look stronger. So you have a situation and you have an argument that is supporting a position. And then there's another position, right? Your position. And you may have an argument or you may not. Now, if you can make their argument look bad and then their position falls, what's left standing? Your, your position, right. So, um, for example, let me see if your book has a, I, I get some of these books uh, mixed up. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, here's a, here's a good example. Pledge of Allegiance. There's a lot of controversies over that, right? Should we have the word in God in the Pledge of Allegiance? Um, some of the people who don't like the in God part. What they want to do is retain the Pledge of Allegiance but take the in God part out. Because that was actually put in later on. Right? It wasn't part of the original pledge. That was put in uh, in part because we were worried about communism. And, and communists were godless and you know if we could keep everybody believing in some sort of you know abstract deity, we might be able to fight against communism. So maybe it's outworn its usefulness. Um, Personally, I, I don't believe so, because I'm sort of a traditionalist when it comes to institutions and things like that. I see some public good in them. But some of the people that are arguing um, for getting rid of that phrase, they're being portrayed as if they're arguing for getting rid of the pledge entirely. But that's not the case. 
So if you say, yeah, they want to get rid of the pledge entirely, they want to take the very last vestige of God out, out of schools, well, you may be distorting their position, right? Um, when you do strongman, you distort or you oversimplify or you um, just falsify sometimes the opponent's position. Um, the other, the, the, the textbook that we used to have for this had this great example about uh, gay marriage. And it was somebody who was saying, um, so-and-so wants to legalize gay marriage in this town. Uh, now, you know what he's really for. He wants them to be having sex out in public, right in front of our children, rolling around in the dirt. You know, is that really what you want? And now, is that what the person was actually for? No. I mean, they were making an argument about uh, being able to be married and presumably, you know, observing the laws about public behavior that, that don't let you, don't let homosexuals or heterosexuals engage in sexual behavior out in public, right? Um, he wasn't making any sort of claim about that. But if you attribute something like that, then your position looks better. Or think about abortion. Both sides do the straw man fallacy all the time. If you're uh, for abortion, then really what you're for is, is killing innocent babies, as many as you can possibly can, right? Is, is that what mo there are a few people actually, by the way, out there who, who are kind of on the fringe who see abortion as a positive good. Do most people who are pro-abortion regard abortion as something that is really good to do just on its own? You know, have as many abortions as possible. No. So if you attribute that position to them, you're doing the uh, straw man. If, um, if you're against abortion, what are, what are people liable to say about you? You hate women. You want women to be in the back alleys having abortions. You want to put their lives at risk. That's kind of a, what we call a canard, because there aren't a lot of back alley abortions, and there weren't a lot of back alley abortions even when abortion was illegal. So if somebody is attributing that to their opponent, they are distorting or, or falsifying their position. Um, could you actually find a few people who are for that sort of thing? Probably. And you can find wackos in any cause. Um, but that's not where the mainstream is for that position. That's not the arguments that they actually make for it. Um, where else do you see strong men? Think about when, when couples disagree about finances. Right? Uh, put politics aside. Um, you, look, what are the, the arguments usually about? They're about buying this or not buying this. Some big ticket item. And how do they go? Honey, I think that we should buy this new refrigerator because it's on sale and it's much better than the one that we've got and it's energy efficient. Okay, that's, a, that's an argument, that's a position. You just want to spend all of our money. That's what you want to do. Every time some, some you know, new item comes along, you want to buy it. Is that what they're saying? <coughs> Is that their argument? No. So what's going on there is, you know, uh, their argument's been falsified. And then, you know, you can look at the other person's position. We shouldn't spend the money. Um, oh, yeah. That, that, could, that could be a, a good uh, straw man argument, too. Yeah. You actually want to spend the money on, on some, some other item. You never want to buy the things that I want to buy. We don't share priorities. You know, these things can spiral out of control. You have to be very careful when using ad hominems or straw man arguments because what are you actually doing? Every time you do that, you make an attack. And when you attack people, what, what usually happens? They try to attack you back. What's that? They try to attack you back. They try to attack you back? What would you say? Defense. They get defensive, yeah, they become angry. Um, oftentimes the, the sides get drawn and then neither one can actually see what the other one is saying once they, once they uh, get sort of locked into battle lines. And then if that's the case, then nobody's able to evaluate arguments well. Nobody's able to evaluate claims on their own merit. Um, unfortunately, these sort of fallacies are very common in our, our ordinary life, aren't they? 
our ordinary life, our politi political life. We haven't actually talked about um, uh, buying and selling, you know, consumerism. But, you know, if you, see, if you look at advertisements, do you see a lot of ad hominem or straw man arguments? I think if you start looking, you'll, you'll see quite a few of them. So, this is one that's very hard to uh, get rid of, especially if we feel ourselves to be under attack then we do become uh, defensive. We do often resort to these sorts of things. These can often be defense mechanisms. Um, well, you don't know what you're talking about because you're a, pick whatever you like. Um, all right, 